there's been a theme this week of us, me included, George, the producer, going, we support protest. We support, you know, even disruption to, to public yeah. areas and stuff for points being made. But this felt different. And it felt yeah. like other things were going on. So in saying that, let me just jump straight to uh, John Minto, who's going to join us now. John, thanks so much for coming on to BHN this morning to have a quick chat with us. We appreciate your time, and we know we haven't got you for long, so I will just jump straight into a question, which is based around a uh, conversation going on in the media at the moment, and I'm just bringing up a stuff article here that's talking about it and has headlined it, talking about we did things differently in the 81 Springbok tour uh, compared to the parliamentary riots. I won't even read that because I know we've got you for a limited time. I guess I just would like to get your thoughts around what you saw over the last week at Parliament and the comparisons, or not, some are saying it's inaccurate comparison, to the 81 Springbok tour and the splitting of the nation, et cetera, et cetera. The floor is yours, sir. Well, it's there's no comparison with, with 1981. 1981, it was a... There was a, um, there was a clear objective, there was a clear strategy, and we were, um, were a very... Um, Discipline focused and 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 and, and organised group. I think the best comparison with what happened um, with the Wellington protest was the Occupy uh, protests of about ten years ago, when people were camped out in Wellington and Auckland uh, around the country, and in fact around the world, to protest against the fact that you know the whole global financial system was falling down, and and governments were bailing out the rich. They weren't um, weren't helping out the people at at, at the bottom, but they were. Um, you know, helping maintain the profits of the of the rich at the top. So the Occupy movement, it's it, it suffered too from not having a clear um, clear objectives or a clear strategy, and uh, and and it it ended up much the same way. After a, after a few weeks, the 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 police moved in and um, and and you know. Um, you know, move, move, move people out. It wasn't. It didn't end up in scenes like we've seen in Wellington, which were you know obviously there were appalling scenes. Um, but I think the, the the most important takeaway from Wellington is that New Zealand is a deeply, deeply divided country, and what Wellington did was just brought those divisions to the, to the fore. I know there are people who say oh, it was all far right people, it was uh, it was anti vaxxers it was this and this conspiracy theorists, and yeah, that those people were there, but there were a lot of good, decent people, uh, good, decent Kiwis in there. And uh, the core of it being concerned about vaccine mandates. And we haven't actually had a proper discussion in New Zealand about vaccine mandates. And I think we're, we're the worst off for it. So I think, um, yeah, the, yeah, it's it's not a comparison that uh, with 80, 81 is, is, is not the comparison. I mean, there was a, you know, we, New Zealand's had occupations for a, on and off for a long time. We had the first occupation I was involved in was Bastion Point. Yeah. which went on for 506 days before the police <laughs> and the army moved in. And, um, and and those were, you know, that was civil disobedience protest, and uh, as, as as the Wellington one was. And I have to say I was pleased with the way the police reacted the first few weeks. I wasn't pleased with what they did on, on the last day because it was clearly, with the tension around, it was clearly going to end in, end in violence, and I don't think it needed to. Mark, as you can jump in, we've only got three or four minutes with John, so I'm, I'm welcome to give the floor to you as well. If you've got a question for John or comment, go for it. Um, I would like to kind of follow up on this notion of the deep, deep division, um, mm. because I, I sometimes wonder how these like discursive strategies we use around division, what they actually refer to. I do think there are, you know, obviously lots of different concerns that we should be bringing to the forefront when we talk about politics. Mm. Um, but I'm I'm a little bit reluctant to to pick this up and say there's some deep seated division that for, is supposed to be new, right? So I'd like to kind of like follow up, like what is what is this division? And yeah, you know, well, I think I, it? yeah. Look, the 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 division is not about vaccines or mandates. The division is actually a socio-economic division. It is the fact that um, for 40 years we've had neoliberal economic policies where the working class have seen their standards of living go backwards. They've seen the the opportunities for their children shrink to less than their own opportunities. In other words, they see themselves going backwards. And um, that critical division is means that you have you have a lot of power people who feel powerless, right? Lots of people feel very powerless. And when you feel powerless in society, the things you seize onto the most are the things that you can control and people could control 
whether they got a vaccine or not. And a lot of people said, no, we're not going to get vaccines. Um, and uh, and they were in mostly working class people in vulnerable communities. They said no. And then the government turned around, having said no, there'll be no there'll be no vaccine mandates. There'll be no um, there'll be no sanctions on anyone who doesn't get a vaccine. The government changed its mind and said, yes, we are going to have vaccines uh, and vaccine mandates. And that was a bridge too far. I think it was the wrong thing to do. And the World Health Organization was was very clear in warning. It, it, it said vaccine mandates should be the last resort. And they are especially dangerous in countries which have big social divisions, where you have um, minority groups that are already vulnerable to the sort of anti-vax messaging and, and all of that stuff which, which goes on. And they said that people will see this as oppression of them. And that's exactly what the Wellington people saw. And the fact that 30% of New Zealanders had sympathy for the Wellington protest. I think that shows we've got, you know, very, very deep division. If it hadn't been on vaccine mandates, it would have been on something else. So I think I'm, I'm looking at a wider picture rather than just, um, you know. What I hear you saying, John, is that the deep division is not necessarily about this issue, but this no. issue was the thing to bring forward the deep division. It's yes, sort of a exactly. and leg argument. Because what yeah. I'd also say is, I don't think there is a deep division about vaccines or mandates because, for example, the vaccines, it's like it's a 90 to 95 percent agreement in the, in the country with five percent outliers. And I think also, even if it was 70, 30 and I saw that poll, that still shows the majority of New Zealanders support the mandate. Mm. But what I want to say is I, the, the protest of the parliament was not about the mandates. It really wasn't. It was an anti-vaxxer uh, protest in well, general. And I think, oh, it was, right. I think it was couching itself as mandates. And I say that for a couple of reasons. I know lots of people who are in business, who are double vaxxed, who wear masks every day, who are against the mandate because they can see that there are holes in it. The people who were at the at the protest, not to disrespect them, weren't those people. They were the unmasked, this is fake. We watch counterspin media. Uh, it was really an anti-vaccine protest, in my honestly held belief, that was yeah. being couched as an anti-mandate, because there are some arguments to be made for the mandate conversation, mm. but they mm. weren't being made. So that's yeah, why I think they no, I, I, the yeah, people walk in sheep's clothing that protest. Yeah, well, in a sense, I in a sense, I I can I can only agree. I mean, you you can spin it lots of different ways, but either way you look at it, it um, I would say um, lots of people came. Lots of people went there because I mean, thousands of people have been turfed out of their jobs because of because of um, because of the mandates. And they feel angry about that. And a lot of those people were there. But then there were all these other agendas there, there as well. And, and the far right were there trying to push their, 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 their views. But, I mean, the thing I would say is that the, the fringe became the protest in Wellington. And that was, you know, I mean, I, I said it on day one, if they, if that it, it looked incoherent, it looked um, disorganized, leaderless, and it would therefore fail because there was there was no goals and no strategy, and and that's what happened. But um, there was yeah, there's still this debate we have never had about about mandates, which I think we've. That, um, that's right. That's right. The debate didn't actually get had because it was, no. in my opinion, an anti-vaxxer mandate. And let me just say mm. one more thing before we let you go, John. Thank you for your time, because you've just echoed it in the stuff article and the article that are going around at the moment talking mm. about how it's not a comparison to the 81 Springbok tour. Yeah. One of the main points that have been made, that is, as I'm reading it off the article, in 1981, the message was primarily singular, whereas Absolutely. the message in the week that's just gone was multicolored and multifaceted, and every person had a slightly different message for what they wanted to get through. So that's another way, I guess, that it's being said by some of your former colleagues from 1981 that, yes. you know, please don't compare, compare this to that. It's a completely... Different thing. Uh, Mark, do you, you want to wrap with anything for the last kind of 60 seconds before we let John go? No, I think it's, um, it, it, I think highlighting that protest isn't just arbitrary of people, you know, showing up angry, but oftentimes when there is large scale protest, there's a lot of people behind that have put a lot of thought mm -hmm. into strategizing how to get the message out and how to stay on message. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think this is also a lesson for people who say, oh, you know, people who get angry don't know what they're doing. Sometimes like, it takes a lot of effort to protest things um, successfully. So yeah, I think like no. the tour was like it was so highly, you know, organized and there's so much strategy behind it 
and yeah. to compare, you know, like, of course you can compare a question to show you. <laughs> no, you can't. I think just, I'll just mention one thing, which uh, I think we should all be, we should all be aware of um, uh, that, um, you know, th there's been a huge backlash to the, to the Wellington protest and, you know, quite, quite, quite rightly. But one of the, one aspects just come up in Christchurch where the city council are now going to the Freedom and Rights Coalition and saying that they have to pay $24,000 for traffic management for the protest marches, which they've organized in the last few weeks. And that seems to me to be absolutely outrageous. We're, I've been involved in protests for 40 years. We've never paid a cent to city councils for any traffic management. And if this becomes a precedent, then suddenly um, the right to protest gets heavily compromised. So we've got, to, we've got to, if we see these things, we've got to call them out. And hopefully um, the, the mayor and councillors down here will get up and say, no, that's not going to happen in Christchurch. Hey, John, thank you for your time. But before you leave, I just want to share a comment with you that's just come in because it's directly to you. And it's, I think it's kind of lovely. Crazy Old World has just commented. You don't know if Crazy Old World's male or female or other. Uh, but Crazy Old World has says, John, thank you. I was on the wrong side of 81 and you opened my eyes. So what a lovely way to, to finish up this conversation and you know, personal thanks from them as well. Okay, no, thank, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it.